With those who seek mystery and meaning, wisdom and grace, we, we wish to see Jesus. Jesus. As we seek the face of God, let us worship together through song. <laughs>
protector and his wealth. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming his way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay you back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The reason that this comes off a little more personal for me is that the story of Zacchaeus is about the best and only gospel good news story I have. It expresses my own deepest faith and belief about Jesus, about God. for a 
behavior as Christians during the week. Confidentially in that group, one of our members came out as a gay man. And then he asked if he could still be a Christian. And to be honest, we weren't sure. So as a group, we come through the scriptures, we studied, we prayed, we held one another to good faith, and one night, I'll never forget it, we landed on Zacchaeus. And it was a turning point. You see that children's song that we all start out with, it leaves out the best parts. It's not that Zacchaeus was small or insignificant, it's that he was a tax collector. He was greedy. He was wealthy off of other people's money. He was a Roman collaborator. Jesus calling his name to head to his dinner, his house for dinner, was not an act of sweet kindness to a lonely child. It was a scandal. Here he is dining with the man and the whole community had labeled as a sinner, rejected and loathed by everyone around him. Except the story makes clear Zacchaeus then gives away half of what he owes to the poor and pays back four times what he owes to anyone. He's defrauded. And so Jesus pronounces today salvation has come to this house. Because Zacchaeus is no longer the lonely man in the trees, but the host who had gathered with Jesus. Except, of course, for the religious leaders who refused to come in, afraid they'd be tainted by his company. Back in that Bible study more than 25 years ago now, this study taught us that saints and sinners aren't such easy categories. They weren't for Jesus and they aren't for us. He was always spending time with the people that everyone else wanted to throw us off. The people on the margins, the ones the other ones called sinners, the ones the religious leaders often turned away. So, my campus ministry group developed a welcome statement, very similar to the one that you'll see at the AGM today if you haven't read it already. Then we led a successful process to get our whole family board to vote in support. We were the second campus ministry in the entire U.S. in the denomination to do this process. We were very happy. Except it didn't go well for us after that. The higher church authorities objected. They replaced all of us on the governing board, fired the chaplain, and changed the locks on the door so we couldn't get back. What hurt me most from that experience wasn't about the authorities of the church disagreeing or disapproving of our decision. It's that they wouldn't let us stay at the table. They wouldn't stay at the table with us. Realistically, they told us the table belonged to them and we had lost our seats. We had made what we thought was a faithful decision after months of prayer and study together. We didn't expect it to be popular. We didn't expect everyone to agree. But we thought at least we could share a meal, be a community, look one another in the eye around the table. My future was in jeopardy. I couldn't pursue denomination ministry in that context anymore. They literally kicked me and my friends out. I almost lost my faith altogether. It deeply altered the whole trajectory of my life. How I rebuilt is another set of stories for another day, but I want to tell you what I learned. Which is that following Jesus 
requires us to be in community with those who are different from me. It taught me that I want to sit at Zacchaeus' table. Because anyone who wanted to dine with Jesus, or hear him teach, or ask for his healing, or beg for his prayers, anyone who wanted to meet Jesus on that night had to sit at Zacchaeus' table to do it. The holiest priest, the highest Pharisee, pull up a chair. You can sit right next to those illiterate fishermen from the Galilee. You'll also find various tax collectors in multiple states of reform, some former lepers and some people possessed by demons, oh, and definitely women of questionable reputation, maybe even a Samaritan or two. That's who we got. Come on in. This is not a comfortable dining situation in a relaxed environment. People don't always like each other. They certainly don't agree and may even think that sitting next to each other brings them into disrepute. It's risky. It's conflicting. It requires courage and vulnerability and relies solely on the fact that Jesus loves each one of them and calls them by name to be at the table. That's the table I want. Because as long as we can sit together at their tables, then there is hope. There's hope that we might be able to find a way to, to overcome racism and prejudice, homophobia. There's hope for all at the table that we could work together to reverse climate change or end poverty or stop this latest awful war and every other one. But we have to start by hanging in at Zacchaeus' table. So when I was 41, I applied to be the senior minister at the American International Church in London. And I did it because this place sounded like, to me, it could be like Zacchaeus' table. Inviting homeless guests to the soup kitchen for lunch every day, bringing people in need of shelter inside 10 or 20 weeks a year, pulling together from people from different races and nations and cultures and languages in one Christian community. People from different Christian churches that don't even speak to each other in our own countries. But here we sit side by side in one church. CEOs and teachers and care workers and rough sleepers and students and bankers and caterers all at one table. This imperfect though it is, this is where I have always wanted to be. Because Zacchaeus' table is the one place I know that I will still always be able to find Jesus. The work of our congregation is about, that the work that we have been doing intentionally as a congregation about welcome and inclusion makes public and loud our hope that we can be that kind of place. It's why I care passionately about not just the work of saying it, but acting it, living it, including opening our space and our altar to same-sex and opposite-sex couples. I want to call down those lonely souls out there still hiding in trees and tell them they can meet Jesus here. Tell them we've got a chair at this table as long as they're willing to hang out with us. But hear this also. I care equally passionately
make room for each other. Because here's what I've really come to realize over all those years of trying to stay at Zacchaeus' table. It stopped being Zacchaeus' table a long time ago. Pretty much the moment Jesus invited himself over. Zacchaeus didn't have control over the guest list. He was just a guest like everyone else. It was Jesus himself who became the host in that moment, pulling out the extra chairs, greeting everyone by name, making room. Before you know it, it's Jesus handing around the bread and the wine and making sure everybody who's hungry gets something to eat. And when the tensions start to flare and the conflict starts to bubble, it is Jesus who lays out his own body, his own blood, that love and grace and forgiveness and welcome I pour out for all Thanks be to God.
that you call from the ground to the tree, across the sea, across the pew, to each and every one of us. And we give you thanks this day for bringing us into community together, even when it's hard, and especially when it's joyful. We give you thanks for all the joys in our life this day, from the giggles of babies to the sun and warmth breaking through yet again, to the glow of a candle in the last moments of someone's life. Thank you, God, for bringing us together in these moments, for giving us the gift of your creation and allowing us to enjoy it fruitfully. But yet we know, O oh God, that not everyone everywhere in this world has that same joy this day. And so we pray for all people in all situations that find it difficult just to get through the next minute. For those in conflict zones, for those with hungry stomachs, for those without a place to sleep. May we too reach out to them, reach out with our whole bodies, our whole souls, and welcome them into the And may we too share all that we have. God, you've called us to minister with each other, alongside each other, to each other, in every circumstance. And so we pray, whether it's the dinner table, the negotiating table, or the communion table, that we sit down together with genuine purpose, with love for one another, with a willingness to see it through the tough times in order to get back to joy. And so God, no matter where I am at this day, no matter where we are at this day, we come to you in the silence now, lifting up all of our joys and all that gives us worry. God, be with us now, be with this church, each and every step, so that all who look upon know we are Christians, know we are with you by our love. And so, united in that love, we come together once again to pray those words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Once again, welcome to this moment of worship with the American International Church here in London. A special welcome to you if you are new with us this day. A special welcome to you if this is still your first time back after so long. We are glad you are gathering around this table with us. If you are new with us this day, we would like to be in touch with you throughout the week and the days ahead. You can find a QR code you can scan on the back of your bulletin, or there are sheets in the back where you can give us a few of your details to be in touch with you later that way. There's full details on everything going on in the life of the church in the back of your bulletin. I invite you to look at that. Just as I'd like to invite you to attend our annual general meeting just after worship. Feel free to grab a copy, a few biscuits, 
can meet back here in the room in about five minutes after worship finishes, and we'll hear we'll hear about reports on the ministry and life of the church, review our finances together, and share news on our charity status, as well as elect new members and nominate others to our different committees, and then continue in this conversation on inclusion and welcome here at the American International Church. I invite all of you attend, to attend, whether members or not, if you'd like to join in that discussion, though please note that only members are able to vote in each matter. And as a final bit, I'd like to invite Scott up to say a few words about a couple of different things that are coming up, including a benefit concert, but also maybe a few words on our upcoming launch in a few weeks' time. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for your singing. And one of the great things about this job is being able to stand right here and hear that and come back at me. It's, it's amazing. This has a beautiful acoustic, this room. And even with your masks on, you know, your singing is very inspirational, at least to me and I think to all of us as well. We sit up here. You think we sing to you, but you've got to go back for that. I do want to tell you about on the 3rd of April, you see in your, in your flyer that we have a very special service that morning. From time to time, we do Bach and Tadas here, and we often work with the city um, Bach Collective. These are some of the finest period instrument players in the world. That is, they play instruments that sound like they did in Bach's time. They are wonderful players, and they love coming here to perform with us. But on that day, not only will we have them, but we will also have Eclectic Voices, which is the other choir that I conduct, about 40 voices joining us. So it's going to be filled with instruments and singers up here at the front, and this is the most, probably the most tuneful Bach cantata of all of them. It's a really lovely cantata that is just a very uplifting, and it's an Easter cantata. That's what we'll be doing in the morning that day. Then in the afternoon that day, some of you also know that I'm the conductor, director, and always have been of the London Jazz Orchestra, who I'm very proud and lucky to direct. This is one of the finest big bands in the world. I have no, uh, no worry about saying that. We uh, live in a jazz club. We usually play the first Sunday of every month in a jazz club. But this next, this first Sunday in April, that's the third, we're actually not going to be playing in the Vortex Jazz Club, we're going to be playing here in the afternoon. And that's for a special reason. One is the acoustic is fantastic for jazz in this room. But really the reason is that one of our very, very good friends, Tina May, a wonderful singer, is desperately ill. And she's not been able to work for six months. She's, she's really in a, a, a bad way. So we decided we would take our performance, we would bring it here, and we would do a benefit concert for her. So we'll have the full of jazz orchestra, and we'll have two great singers, Ethan Walkers and Bridget Barama, with us to do a concert that afternoon. About an hour and 20 minute straight through concert at 4.30 in the afternoon. And I hope that you, just if you like to hear jazz, you'll love the performance, but also if you'd like to support our effort to raise some money to help Tina and her family, that would really, really be great. So it's gonna be a full, Full day of music here on the 3rd of April, and we hope you'll come and go have some lunch, come back and join us for the concert in the afternoon. And that is in two weeks' time. Now, as we prepare for our final hymn and we welcome our kids back into the sanctuary with us, I'd like to give you this moment to once again consider how you offer yourself up to the church, how you bring yourself to the table. Be that in the sharing of your resources, in your time, even in your singing here in this space together. If you'd like to give or consider giving, you can find details at the back of your bulletin. But if all you have today is a voice, that is okay too. And let us join together then in the song.
visit the table for a cup of tea, <laughs> come back for the annual, annual meeting table. But no, we are one body. This church, this building, it's not our table, it's not Zacchaeus's. It is Christ's alone. And so, with that, we can say, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, now and always. Amen. Amen. Amen.